bienvenidos al primer Rootstock Summit. ¿Cómo andan? ¿Todos bien? Levanten la mano los que están bien. Para abajo los que están mal. <risa> qué bueno. Qué bueno tenerlos acá. La verdad que es muy emocionante estar acá con ustedes. Ahora creo que en la presentación les voy a contar por qué es muy emocionante. Porque esto es, digamos, que el, el fruto de, diría que más de una década de, de búsquedas de diferentes personas ¿no? que arman este equipo. Eh, y este es el primer Rootstock Summit. Hemos hecho encuentros, digamos, dentro de otras conferencias. Siempre la comunidad se, se junta, tiene, tiene su espacio dentro de las conferencias más grandes de, del mundo, diría, Consensus, eh, Consensus, perdón. Eh, Consensus, la Bitcoin, siempre está presente, pero es la primera vez que se hace un, un summit, un encuentro 100% del ecosistema Rootstock. Así que están siendo parte de, de un hito histórico, por lo menos para nuestro ecosistema. Y, digamos, la, la charla se, se llama Build to Last, ¿no? La voy a dar en inglés, creo, o en español, no sé, en qué la doy. Que, que eligen. Bueno, creo que tenemos gente que es solo angloparlante, así que la voy, a, la voy a hacer en inglés. If we think uh, about the history of humanity, we have been trying to conquer uh, the physical world since our inception. No, we have been trying to create infrastructure that brought civilization. What I have on my back is the Via Appia from Rome the first roads that Rome created, uh, because in their vision, you know, civilization was infrastructure, was also the codex, the Roman codex, the law. They also created the first aqueducts, the first ways of carrying water and distributing water in the cities and across cities. So, you know, all this infrastructure created civilization, created the means for humans to evolve, to thrive. And I would say that the physical world dominated for thousands of years, for most of our history. Uh, we keep innovating. We have the combustion engine. Thanks to that, we have the railroads, the cars, different means of transportation that connected the world, that allowed us to, to create a globalized world, a world that is fully connected on the physical realm. Also, we have done magnificent, you know, uh, achievements, uh, engineering feats. We are trying to reach for the skies. Um, but something new happened around 50 years ago, a little bit over 50 years ago. That is that the digital world emerged. The digital world was born thanks to the integrated circuit. So now the conquest, the conquest of the digital world started. So it was no longer a physical world. We also created a new world, a world that belonged to humanity. So we became kind of gods in this sense by creating a new world. And this is how the, <laughs> the early attempts of conquering that digital world look. You know, we were not that good at design back then, but it's okay. We created tools to interact with this digital world. Actually, we use that digital world to also keep conquering the physical world, no? And the space and the stars. So this digital world started to intertwine with the physical world and with our efforts of conquering the physical world. And that's, that's amazing, but the digital world is new, so the infrastructure for the digital world needs to be built uh, for that world to develop, to become as advanced as the dominion, or our dominion of the digital world to become as advanced as our dominion of the physical world. And we did so, no? we created the internet. We started connecting computers, creating a world where anybody can access all the information in the world from the palm of their hands. 
we created a, a world where we can communicate with each other remotely uh, at very cheap or we feel free uh, cost and at and, and no cost. And that was a big evolutionary step in creating this infrastructure, this digital infrastructure for the digital world to evolve. And of course, this is the foundation of the metaverse, which is another way of representing this digital world in a more human uh, form. But something amazing in this construction of this digital world infrastructure happened. Uh, I would say the idea came to life 14 years ago, and the realization, the first realization of this came 13 years ago. That was that for the first time, much like we created the combustion engine to create me different means of transportation and production, for the first time we had the infrastructure, the digital infrastructure, to create a scarcity, digital scarcity. And that was thanks to Bitcoin. And Bitcoin was the beginning of, if you want, new digital infrastructure, our Via Appia uh, or our aqueducts to conquer the management of value in this digital world. But as we learn about Bitcoin, and Bitcoin is an amazing tool, it's a tool that can remove a lot of the violence in society because it creates a reserve of value that is neutral, that hasn't, doesn't have a political Uh, sign, therefore it stops the need for the power, the, the, the political nation that is in power uh, to, to create wars to defend the reserve asset they have, whether it's the, the, the British pound or the US dollar or the solidus in the case of Rome. So, you know, we are removing that need for war to protect that reserve of value. So Bitcoin will be extremely transformative and it's the beginning of the separation of money and state. But Bitcoin alone cannot be a payment processing system for the whole humanity because it does, doesn't scale by itself. It cannot be the asset that people who live day by day, week by week or month by month use because it's too volatile. You need you know, stable assets in order to operate in the short term. So we, the, the founders of, of Rustog decided to extend uh, you know, Bitcoin capabilities to be able to serve any human being in society, to bridge the gap between all the value that Bitcoin creates and the needs of the 80% of the population who cannot maybe store value in the mid to long term, who needs daily payments, who need uh, decentralized finance, but tailored to their uh, daily lives, no? And what I will share with you is a little bit of our history, how we, because this, this was not something that happened overnight. Like, we wake up one morning and say, okay, let's expand Bitcoin, that's it. No, it's like, it was a process of individual process and collective process of building this. And If I, I can like backtrack this to the earliest moment, I would say this started with the search of our chief scientist, the IOV Labs chief scientist, Sergio, uh, to create what he called the mental poker framework that basically was a decentralized poker game system. Sorry, Sergio, I know I'm trashing your, <laughs> your idea, but I'm oversimplifying. And in that pursuit of creating like a truly decentralized poker game system that needed to be general purpose, he got in touch with Bitcoin. Is that correct, Sergio? More or less, yes. Uh, and, um, but at the beginning, Sergio wanted to attack Bitcoin. He, he said, this is a scam. Not necessarily a Ponzi, but this cannot, be, cannot work. So, you know, Sergio entered Bitcoin to attack it. And actually, he did succeed in finding key vulnerabilities of Bitcoin. Nine, I think, nine key vulnerabilities of Bitcoin. Some of them that would have killed Bitcoin. But 
when he realized how beautiful it was the design of, uh, of Bitcoin, he decided he needed to stay to protect it. Um, and also, well, I would say also in the same, at the same time that Sergio entered into Bitcoin to attack it, I got in touch with Bitcoin through a friend of mine and didn't get it, basically. So, you know, it's, it's a tough thing. It's like, you know, I, saw, I thought, well, it's digital money, not so interesting. It might work, you know, but uh, I didn't see, like, the true innovation in it. But in 2012, when Sergio was decided to stay in Bitcoin to protect it, indeed, he was part of the core development, development team of Bitcoin, uh, through another friend, I got in touch with Bitcoin again and, and finally got it. Finally, I understood that Bitcoin was the beginning of a new revolution, a, a new innovation cycle in this digital world creation, and decided to devote myself also to create a Bitcoin community in Latin America and, and start building around Bitcoin uh, because I thought it was a tool for transformation for our region and, of course, for the world. And I invite you to check the Bitcoin wiki to see what Sergio did, but because, for example, cross-chain, now everybody talks about blockchain interoperability. Well, actually, Sergio was the first one to create a, a model in 2012. We are talking 10 years ago on how to create interoperability between two blockchains. Um, so then in 2013, Sergio created the first Turing Complete, cryptocurrency, that's one year before Ethereum was announced, or nine months before Ethereum was announced. So, again, he was following uh, his pursuit of creating this Turing Complete or this poker game. I think, finally, you will tell us someday why you discarded the idea, but there were some points that were not working. And at the same time, I started creating the Bitcoin communities in Latin America, La Bitconf, which will happen, this summit is a side event to La Bitconf, the biggest Latin American Bitcoin conference, and I would say the longest lasting Bitcoin conference in the world. Um, and decided myself uh, to devote, to translate Bitcoin into tools for financial inclusion. So that's how it started. We started doing some experiences, um, with, uh, with, with people in, in the slums of Buenos Aires, trying to see how Bitcoin worked for them. And then we realized all the things that I just shared, that Bitcoin was not enough if we wanted to serve anybody in the world, in, in society. At the same time, T-9, 2014, Sergio joined efforts with Ruben Alman and Adrian Edelman, here present, Adrian, uh, to turn Quickscoin into Nimblecoin, you know, and and they started building together, you know, an, an implementation and, and meeting together in a cafe that will go in history as the, the I would say, the precursory place. It was Gran Torino, no? The name? The Gran Torino. So they were meeting in that cafe, having uh, Café con Leche and Media Lunas, very classical Argentinian and discussing, we always recall, because the café con leche was basically a bucket of café con leche. It was impossible to drink it. We don't know why, you know, because I think it's like they had this huge, huge cup with café con leche. Um, and, you know, I, I started the Bitcoin Embassy in Buenos Aires, now called the Espacio Bitcoin, the Centro Cultural Espacio Bitcoin, and joined forces with the other co-founder of, of Rustock. Gabriel Kurman, with whom here present as well. Gaby, say hi to the people. <laughs> so, um, you know, we, we joined forces to, to create Coibanks. Coibanks is a company we built to create a, a translation layer for the finance, traditional financial institutions and the blockchain technology. That was the original idea, and the, Coibanks is the leader today, or one of the leaders in Latin America in doing that today, so it's still alive and, and thriving. And as part of that, with, with uh, Gaku, we were doing a roadshow to fundraise for Coibanks, not very successful one, sometimes things don't work. <laughs> but in that process, a, a shared friend, 
um, a friend introduced me to Nick Sabo. Actually, it was like a trap because he told me, come to have some, some wine or coffee in, in Palo Alto. We were there in a corner. Suddenly he said, oh, wait a minute. He went around the corner and, and brought Nick Sabo. And then the conversation started for those who don't know uh, who Nick Sabo is. Nick Sabo is the creator of, of the concept of a smart contract. He's like, he has been creating this concept and, and sharing a lot of knowledge around decentralized platforms and, and man, different sovereign ways of minting money since early 90s. That's how old he's, he's one of the grandparents of, of the movement, of the centralization movement. He was interested in knowing what we were doing in Latin America with Bitcoin. And then we started discussing that it was a pity that Ethereum was deci decided to create like a separate network altogether and a separate currency instead of leveraging on all the good things that Bitcoin had. And after that conversation, we reach out to Sergio and then the conversations start around how we could extend Bitcoin uh, to become a full financial system. We were work, working on the white paper. Basically, the white paper was created by Sergio with all the background he had because he has been building this technology and thinking about the technology for many years. So he created this white paper. We discussed some things together around the architecture. For example, the definition of like not having our own, our own currency but using Bitcoin because in game theory, uh, you know, if a secondary network has a different token than the primary network, then the secondary network might become a threat for the primary network if it, it becomes too big. So we decided that was a big decision because Ethereum, you know, allowed to, to fund themselves because they minted or created the round currency. So it was a big decision not to have our own currency. We decided to use the Ethereum virtual machine because we saw by, by then that the, the Ethereum community was creating a, an amazing community of developers. And, you know, there's no ego in this. We are trying to get the best of all the existing technology to make the best solution possible. So for us, the innovation in our case was not there, was in other places, in allowing the same miners that protect Bitcoin to protect Rootstock. So basically, that's what we did. But the thing is, like, we were just thinking this was an idea. No, so we shared the white paper with Nick Savo, with Andreas Antonopoulos, with a couple more people we, we respected. But it, the white paper said confidential, like <laughs> all across it. But then Nick got so excited that he tweeted this. Best of Bitcoin currency and settlement system. Best of Ethereum smart contract programming environment. Rootstock. And that was it. We had no choice but to go into the world, find some <laughs> funding, and start building it, because the idea was in the wild. T minus seven. So, and that's how RSK Labs was born in 2016. So you can see here, uh, we have Adrian, the version of Adrian with her, my version with her here. It's like, so you see there are consequences to doing startups in crypto. It's like Gaku that somehow he went in the other direction. He has more hair now. Maybe he got, got our hair. I'm, I'm suspecting that. Uh, then, of course, Sergey and Ruben. Uh, and then Yuan Yuan from Bitmain that was our lead investor. Bitmain, the, the biggest manufacturer of of mining equipment. Of course, for them, it was a no-brainer. We were building value for the Bitcoin ecosystem. Their main business was building hardware for the Bitcoin ecosystem, only for us to exist, even if we were not economically successful, was a big, big uh, uh, investment for them, no? So they supported us, and then we have here the, the original team. Here is Angel Java Lopez. Um, which is an eminent, was an eminence. He was like one of the most respected programmers in Argentina. Uh, they call him Java Lopez because he was the, the early 
you know, educator around Java and also many Microsoft technologies. He passed away recently, but uh, he was with us, and I think he was very happy contributing to Rustock until the, his final days. And for us, it's, it's something we are very proud of uh, to have him as part of our team. Um, you know, my Betty, you know, was there. <laughs> I don't know why these pictures don't help me, but it's okay. Oski, also the first programmer in, in, in Rustock. He's amazing programmer. He, he also did some very interesting things, breaches between Doge and other cryptocurrencies. So Tincho, we, who we, together with Adrian sorted out one of the biggest problems we had is that was like how to do merge mining, to allow the Bitcoin miners to protect two blockchains at the same time without losing profitability on the Bitcoin side. That was something that nobody did before Rustock. And, and he achieved that. He, uh, so big, big uh, team. I think here is Leo, the current CEO of Coibanks, <laughs> who was uh, helping us with legal matters. Um, so this was the beginning, I would say. This, in this year, 2016, is when, when, the, when the alpha version of Rustock appeared. And next year, 2017, T-5, uh, at consensus, we announced the launch of the testnet of Rustock. So, you know, the first, you know, running version of Rustock emerged. I think that was the year I, I cry on stage. I'm not sure, but that's a joke they do because I get emotional and then I cry, but that's it. And then there was these people, I don't know who they are, dressed in costumes that, <laughs> you know, because we work hard, but we also like to play hard, no? And in 2018, we realized that blockchains were not enough. Blockchains, you know, respond to a trilemma where scalability, security, and functionality, you know, are trade off among them. So if you want to have higher scalability to a certain point, you have to sacrifice beyond a certain point, you have to sacrifice decentralization. So you are sacrificing security. If you want to have more functionality, for example, Turing completeness or general purpose programming, you have to sacrifice security because the surface of attack of that system is much, much bigger. Actually, you cannot know certainly what is the surface of attack. No? And that's the thing. Um, so we realized we need to scale blockchains in a third layer. And that's when the concept of Reef emerged. Actually, it emerged in 2017, but in 2018, started the project of creating peer-to-peer -peer protocols, off-chain peer-to-peer protocols that are basically interactions between pe people, exchange of information of, between people, signed information, that relies on the blockchain layer to do settlement and to do re dispute resolution. So in that way, you are not using the blockchain unless something goes wrong or, un or unless you need to update like a meaningful state, for example, of balances in accounts. So that's what, under that concept uh, exists Lightning, payment channels for Bitcoin, Lumino, payment channels for Rustock, uh, the rollups systems. All those are technologies that we decided to package in a single framework. That's what Rustock uh, infrastructure framework is, uh, that, in, that would be easy to use for developers. No? And that's a, an ongoing process. We keep working on that. But another thing happened on the, same, on the same year that was that in January 2018, the RSK, the RSK network went live with 5% of the hashing power of Bitcoin. And over the years, it reached 60% of the hashing power of Bitcoin. So now Rustock is one of the safest, more secure, decentralized smart contract blockchains in the world. And then the hard work began. Because we were so focused on delivering on the technology that we didn't realize that creating an ecosystem sometimes is even tougher than creating the technology itself. Because it's not something you control. You have to 
in a way, bring the, the, the will of others. Like, um, I think the analogy we use is like when you create a new city, in a, you are like conquering new territory. Basically, you choose the best place, no? You choose a place near to the water. You choose, hopefully, a place with a ni nice view. And I think that's what we did. We choose Bitcoin. It's a nice place, close to the water, a lot of abundance there. But then you have to start putting the grid of the city. You have to start, like, you know, uh, providing electricity, bringing the water to each one of the houses. And once you have that, that's when you can start bringing the first pioneers. So, so those pioneers are the people who will do the leap of faith in you, uh, that you will keep the city alive, you will keep the city thriving, the infrastructure in place. And, you know, after you have the pioneers is that you can start bringing the first settlers to live in the city. So getting those pioneers was a hard work. And actually... It took us three years to get those pioneers in place. And those pioneers are Marion Chain, Tropicus, Sovereign, Defiant, Latamexo, Carnaval, for sure I will forget people, Extremian, all of these crypto market. If you are there and I didn't mention you, please <laughs> tell me. But you know, many of those pioneers, early settlers are here. And that took us three years to create this amazing community of which I'm extremely proud because this community, well, I would say Taringa now is one of those uh, settlers. <laughs> as, vamos. <laughs> um, Excapit as well. All amazing settlers. And, and one thing I, I love about them is that all of them are building their solution thinking in the long term. They are thinking, you know, that what we are building is the infrastructure for the future of the digital world, a world that where digital world will, I would say, dominate our lives more than the physical world. And that's the, I would say, the pivoting moment we are. Uh, all of them are building to last. And that's why in 2022, we are doing the relaunch of Rootstock in the hands of the community, new branding, new community engagement, because Rootstock belong to all of us. So if you think like us, if you want to build to last, you are welcome. Come. <laughs>